Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar called Is Pet Love Risky? And we are um, hosting this webinar today on Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, because we know how much we love our little critters and fur babies, and uh, we want to take the opportunity to um, discuss um, some of the risks that might be associated and how it relates to food safety. So, next slide, please. Um, a little bit about the Partnership for Food Safety Education. We develop and promote effective education programs to reduce foodborne illness risk for consumers. And we are a nonprofit organization that relies solely on grants and donations to function. So, thank you so much for joining us today. I am Brittany Saunier. I am the Director of Development with the partnership. And um, my little fur baby who is co-piloting with me today is Thatcher. She's a six-year-old kitty. And um, I'm really excited for today's webinar because unfortunately she's uh, recently been diagnosed with irritable bowel disease. So we've been dealing a lot with um, vomit and feces and all kinds of food <laughs> handling. So. I'm looking forward to today's webinar to um, learn about how I can keep our home safe and clean. Next slide. Our webinar tech support is Michelle Blake, and these are her fur babies, uh, Jack and Kaylee. So thank you, Michelle, for um, keeping us on task and um, functional. Next slide, please. There will be an opportunity to ask questions um, throughout the presentation. Please go ahead and uh, use the question box on the right of your screen to type in your questions, and we will do a Q&A uh, toward the end. Um, and there will also be a brief survey. It'll take about one minute to complete, and we just ask that you uh, do that so uh, we can use that information and apply it to future webinars to ensure we're doing the best we can do. Next slide, please. And we are offering continuing education units for this webinar, um, available from ANFP, CDR, NEHA. There are, um, on the sidebar, you'll notice a handout section. Uh, there you can download the certificates. Uh, we'll also send information in the follow-up email about how to access these or under events tab and webinar recordings on fightback.org, you can find the certificates for these CEUs. Next slide. So we're gonna kick off with a fun question. We wanna know um, of those on the webinar, what kind of pet do you have? So please take some time and um, let us know. All right, well, who do we have represented today? What are the results, Michelle? Oh, it looks like majority of you have some dogs and we have um, kitties represented, couple of you without a pet on. So um, that's exciting to see you on here to learn about um, communicating on handling of pets. Um, thank you, pretty diverse group. Next slide. And you might recall we've asked webinar attendees to submit a photo for a random drawing for a gift card. Here are some photos we received. Um, you'll see uh, the little kitty in the sink there, definitely a food safety um, question. Uh, so thank you for submitting these. These are really cute and fun. So next slide. Today's speakers are uh, joining us from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We're very excited to have them. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Megan Nichols with the Enteric, Enteric Zoonosis Activity Lead and Lauren Stevenson, epidemiologist and health communicator, joining us. Um, so I will kick it over to those two. Thank you. 
Hi everyone, this is Megan Coles at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We're really excited to be here today to talk with you about the topic, Is Pet Love Risky? We thought this was an excellent and provocative, thought-provoking title, and so we're really excited to talk to you and share with you a little bit of the work that um, Lauren Stevenson and myself do here at CDC. So today, we're going to talk a little bit more about the enteric disease risks associated with pets. And enteric diseases are those that affect your gut and your stomach. So we're going to talk about some um, illness associated with those bugs. And when it comes to pets, it can be especially bad. We're also going to examine cleaning and sanitation practices that consumers and others can use to prevent illness because we really want people to be able to have pets, own pets, and enjoy them safely. Next, we're going to discuss how CDC communicates regarding these illnesses and even some of our outbreaks that are linked to contact with pets. It's a little bit different than how we communicate about foodborne outbreaks. So first we wanted to talk about what a zoonotic disease or a zoonosis is. And that's a disease or an infection that's naturally transmissible or can go back and forth between vertebrate animal, animals and humans. These can be diseases or bugs that are bacterial, viral, fungal, or even parasitic. And some of these diseases can be so severe that they prevent efficient production of food of animal origin. So if one of these diseases actually affects some of our cattle, swine, or poultry, it can actually impact production of food. And that can create obstacles to international trade with certain animal products. In the United States, a lot of our um, animals and pet commodities may be exported outside of the US, so trade is a big factor when it comes to talking about these diseases. And the way I like to think about it is that it's not too far upstream from the food we eat. I know a lot of our consumers and others are very, very familiar with the concept of raw poultry containing a germ like salmonella. And they know that in order to mitigate or prevent development of salmonella that you could get from eating something like roasted chicken, you need to cook it to 165 degrees. Well, it's kind of a similar thought process when it comes to our live poultry. The poultry in the store can have salmonella and the poultry that might live in our backyard or in farms can also have salmonella that's in their gut, but it doesn't necessarily make them sick. So it's a good idea when you're thinking about these to think, well, animals are just, especially those that produce food, one step upstream from some of food safety messaging. So how often do we actually see these enteric bugs or these um, gut pathogens come from animals? Well, it's been estimated that over 400,000 illnesses actually occur from seven different groups. And Michelle, if you go ahead and click one more time, we should be able to actually see a graph that demonstrates some of the top pathogens that are caused by animal contact. So if we were looking across all these illnesses, you would see that about 14% of the illnesses caused by the seven groups that are represented here were actually linked to contact animals. Campylobacter, which is a bacteria, and cryptosporidium, which is a parasite, were by far the most common. However, we also saw salmonella, E. coli, listeria, and Yersinia infections that resulted from animal contact. So it's not insignificant when it when talking about burden of disease. So if some of our enteric pathogens come from animal contact, how does it differ from the foodborne contact? Well, this is one thing that I like to highlight for some of our audiences is that the demographics or the people that are affected by enteric zoonoses, the diseases that come from animals, are a little bit different than all of those that are affected by foodborne infection. We also see different types of exposure because it is our pets. The duration of these illness outbreaks is a little bit different and the seasonality is different when it comes to our foodborne and in enteric zoonotic outbreaks. So let's go through some of these. 
So this is data from our National Outbreak Reporting System, which looked at some of the salmonella outbreaks that occurred between 2009 and 2014. And we looked at these outbreaks by age group and broke them up by those that resulted from animal contact and from food. And one of the things that was really interesting to us is that we see more children, especially those that are under the age of five, impacted by outbreaks linked to animal contact than we see outbreaks linked to food. So when we talk about the demographic of the zoonotic infections, children, especially young children, are at greatest risk for illness. And we also know that they're at greater risk for developing severe disease when they become ill. And some of that relates to the type of exposure. So we have two types that we like to talk about here at CDC when it comes to these zoonotic infections. First is, as you'd imagine, direct contact with the animals. Touching them, snuggling, kissing them, and this might happen at petting zoos, at farms, or in homes. And I think those pictures on the right show some really good examples of um, direct contact with the little girls feeding the goats at the petting zoo. But we also have indirect contact, which is a little bit different from our foreign infections where people actually typically eat the food. And this can call, in, involve cleaning animal feces or the environment, touching animal cages, bedding, litter boxes, or actually going into pet stores or multi-purpose spaces that are usually animal spaces, but might be used for other things. Um, a good example is a wedding, a wedding dinner that might be held in a barn where animals usually live. And again, that picture on the right, I think is a really great example of some indirect contact with an animal environment. That child also is a petting zoo at a petting zoo and she's not actually touching any of the animals, but she's got her mouth squarely on that railing and is probably having contact with some of those germs. We also see a little bit of a difference when it comes to occupational exposure of those involved in animal contact outbreaks. So often when someone is involved in an occupation that involves daily contact with animals, and this can include veterinarians, slaughterhouse workers, ranchers, zookeepers, and some others, they might be at greater risk for actually developing an illness that's linked to animal contact, especially if some of their prevention behaviors aren't very good. Um, one of the things you might note here is that postal workers are often on this list. And many people question, well, why on earth would a postal worker who doesn't usually, they deliver mail, they don't usually have, have contact with animals be on this list. Well, we see postal workers pop up a lot in our outbreaks linked to live poultry. Um, they're the ones when someone orders baby poultry over the internet or orders them from their feed store to be delivered direct to their house. The post office workers are actually the ones that carry the boxes of baby chicks from the post office hub and actually deliver it to the household. And some of those baby poultry boxes are really covered in some poultry poop. So that's why we see postal workers. Um, another thing that comes up frequently is a question about, well, if these people are involved in occupations that have animal contact on a regular basis, wouldn't they be immune? So wouldn't they actually be less likely to get an infection? And what the literature shows us is that there is some evidence of short-term or short-duration immunity among people who are frequently exposed to Campylobacter or E. coli 0157. That's not necessarily true for Salmonella. And if you think about it, that's kind of one of the reasons we don't have a good vaccine for Salmonella. So when it comes to occupational or other exposure, um, contact with animals and frequent contact with the germ does not necessarily convey immunity. I also thought this was really interesting. So again, when we looked at our national outbreak reporting system for salmonella, and we looked at outbreaks of animal contact versus outbreaks of foodborne illness, those of you who are very familiar with foodborne outbreaks might notice here we have a peak in the summer. So May through about October, we see an increase in the number of outbreaks that are reported. However, with animal contact outbreaks, it's kind of a slow burn. There's a low rate of them, but it's pretty steady across many of the months of the year. And in fact, sometimes in December, people might decide that they're going to give pets as gifts to people for Christmas. And in that instance, we even see a little increase in some of the outbreaks.
There's also a difference when it comes to some of our public health interventions and recommendations. And Lauren is gonna talk a little bit more about this. But I wanted to highlight these two graphs. So on the left is a foodborne illness outbreak, and this is actually um, people who were involved in an outbreak of salmonella type for Miriam. And on the right is an enteric zoonosis outbreak that actually linked to contact with geckos. And one of the things that you'll notice is around February of 2018, there's a sharp decline in the number of illnesses that were reported in that, in that epi curve for the foodborne outbreak. And one of the reasons you'll see that is because of public health intervention which was actually a recall of the, the implicated contaminated food item in this case occurred. And as a result, we saw a very sharp decline in the number of illnesses associated with the outbreak. So the public health dimension appeared to work pretty well. However, with the enteric zoonotic outbreak, you'll notice that the x-axis actually goes from 2013 all the way through 2015. And one of the reasons is we rely very heavily on education as a public health intervention. We are not able to, nor would we advocate for, recalling or removing someone's pet in the household. So that's why you tend to see these outbreaks occur for a much longer point in time at a much lower rate. All right, so one of the questions that we wanted to find out about the audience is, in your line of work, how often do you get questions on handling pets as it relates to food safety? So we'll go ahead and give you a minute to vote. All right, wrapping up those votes. Oh, so this is interesting. Only 4% of our audience gets questions all the time, but it does appear that over, oh, over 30% get them every so often. So we're hoping that after this webinar, you're gonna be really well-versed. And if you've never been asked a safety question, that next cocktail party, you are gonna be so ready to respond to any of those or even to introduce the topic. All right. So as I mentioned, our public health interventions for these types of animal contact outbreak really rely on a multi-tiered approach. So we might talk to the animal producer. So whoever the farmer is or others who actually raise and produce animals like backyard poultry, we're gonna to talk to them about what implementation of controls they can do in the animal's environment to help reduce the burden of something like salmonella. So that might include things like rodent control on the farm, keeping the poultry's feed um, in a place where it won't get contaminated, and making sure the poultry houses or any areas where the poultry live in Rome are kept clean. That can really help reduce the burden of salmonella in their environment. The next step is actually to talk to retail stores and the industry. So here in the middle, you'll see a great example of what is a feed store, and this is a place where they sell poultry. We also talk to pet stores routinely. And for a while there, we had some people who would go into some of these feed stores and um, with the intent of actually petting the poultry or holding poultry that were in the feed store. And so we talked to the feed stores and said, you know, this is a behavior that puts people at risk in your store of actually getting infection. So in response, many of these feed stores actually put up some railings to discourage people from reaching in and touching the baby poultry. And there were two purposes for that. First, it actually helps the baby poultry because as you can imagine having people reach down into your area and try and pet you and you can be a little stressful. But it also keeps humans safe because it means that People who don't intend to purchase the poultry won't go in and necessarily get those germs. And the next piece is in consumer homes. So educating and empowering consumers about how to um, stay healthy when working with and living with their pets. And we think that is so, so important. We truly believe that the human-animal bond is an incredibly beneficial thing and want to make sure people can enjoy their animals.
So I wanted to highlight some of our recent outbreaks that have occurred. These happened in 2018, and um, one of them was as recent as 2019. So here we never know what kind of an animal might pop up in an outbreak, but in a recent outbreak of Salmonella enteritidis, we had infections that were linked to pet guinea pigs. And this affected nine people, eight different states, and one of them was hospitalized. Most of these people were actually children because as you can imagine, guinea pigs are an incredibly popular classroom and childhood pet. Now we know pet rodents, including guinea pigs, are not necessarily recommended for groups that are at greater risk for serious illness. And that was one of the main things that we wanted to talk about in the outbreak. And that includes children under the age of five years, pregnant women, older adults, and those with weakened immune systems. And the reason for that is just we know that they can carry salmonella, and these groups, if they get salmonella infection, could really have a serious illness. The next outbreak that happened, this was in 2017, or excuse me, 2016 all the way through 2018, was a multi-drug resistant strain of Campylobacter jejuni that were linked to puppy exposure. And in this outbreak, we had over 100 people in 17 states that were affected with illnesses. 23 hospitalizations occurred, which is higher than what we would actually expect. And one of the things that was really interesting to us is that there were a large percentage of young women ages 16 to 21 who were involved in this outbreak. And at first we thought, hmm, I wonder if it's a cosmetic product or something else that this particular population might be exposed to that's causing this Campylobacter outbreak. But lo and behold, many of these were actually employees of a particular pet store. And what we found is that this infection was resistant to the antibiotics that we commonly use to treat Campylobacter infections in both people and in puppies. So one of the messages there was actually to improve antibiotic stewardship in the puppy industry because that actually impacts the health of people. And we know, especially for those pet workers, it's important to keep in mind that the puppies and dogs can carry Campylobacter and might not make them sick. So they might carry it and be completely symptom free. And so we advise that you don't let pet pets lick around mouth and face, that you don't let them lick any open wounds, and that you make sure that you're taking your dog or your puppy to the veterinarian for regular care and checkups. The last outbreak, I'm, or second to last outbreak, I should say, that I'm going to talk about today is an outbreak of salmonella infections linked to pet hedgehogs. And in this was recent here in 2019. We had 11 people in eight states and one hospitalization. And it was really interesting to us. One of the things we wanted to highlight and make sure was going on is that people were washing their hands after handling their pet hedgehog. And especially after cleaning their habitats, toys, and supplies, making sure that wasn't done in something like the kitchen sink where you also might prepare food, but making sure it was done outside of the house, if at all possible. And then again, make sure that this type of animal was the right pet for your family. Again, there are certain groups that might be at more at risk for more severe infection with salmonella. And these animals that carry salmonella might not be the right fit for some of those groups. All right, so lastly, we're gonna talk a little bit about pet food safety, because just like we want our food as humans to be safe, we also want our pets' food to be safe. And there is a law, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and under this law, FDA is responsible for making sure that food for people and for animals is safe, properly manufactured, and properly labeled. However, we still see outbreaks occur. And one of the things that we have noted, especially recently, is the feeding of raw pet food diets. CDC does not recommend feeding raw diets to pets because germs like salmonella and even listeria have been found and detected in raw pet foods, including the packages that have been sold in stores. And these germs can make pets really, really sick. We also know that there have been family members that have gotten sick by handling the raw pet food while in the process of feeding it to their pets or actually taking care of their pets because pets that eat raw pet food actually have more salmonella and other germs in their poop than pets that eat non-raw pet food diets. So 
So the last outbreak here is one that happened in 2018, where we initially detected it because two children in Minnesota actually got sick, salmonella redding, after feeding a pet food product that was raw to their dog. And you can see here that there was recall. And it was really interesting to us to find out, go ahead and look through Michelle, that this was a raw turkey product. So if you think about it, where do turkeys come from? Well, turkeys basically are raised in commercial settings like this one shown in the picture. And then they're sent for slaughter and processing. So here's a picture of that. And what we found in this particular outbreak is that the poultry were then going, or the turkey meat was then going into two products. One that would actually end up potentially in your deli case or on your Thanksgiving table, and another that was raw pet food for pets. So this outbreak not only had a component that was linked to consuming raw pet food or handling raw pet food in the home, but also people who had consumed turkey, for example, at the Thanksgiving table. So it was really interesting to see that a contaminated product could impact not only human food, but also animal food and human and animal health. So they really are linked. All right, so I think here we have another slide. I love seeing these pictures of your pets. I think they are absolutely fantastic. I know Lauren and I couldn't resist the opportunity to include some pictures of our own pets at the end as well. And with that, I believe we're gonna switch over to Lauren to talk a little bit about what's different in terms of our communication about these outbreaks. I love that this little dog has his little paw up to his ear. Um, so we will be discussing a little bit about how we communicate about these animal contact outbreaks or outbreaks from the um, pet food. But before that, we wanted to know, the, do you feel you have the information you need to support consumers on the topic of pet food safety? We'll give everyone a few minutes to answer. All right, let's see what we got. All right, it looks like there's a little bit of a split here. Some people have the materials and some people don't. So I hope after we go through some of the materials that we have here at CDC, you guys will feel a little more confident that you have the stuff that you need. So first, we wanted to kind of talk about why we communicate, why we communicate about these outbreaks. And so as Megan kind of alluded to and mentioned that there's not really um, a single regulatory authority for disease prevention when it comes to the pets that are in our homes. There are some laws and regulations around animal welfare um, and animal health, but since some of these germs don't make animals sick, it's kind of clear sometimes who has the authority. And there really isn't a product action to stop illnesses. So in our foodborne outbreaks and even for the pet food outbreaks, there can be a recall, but we definitely wouldn't recall somebody animal or pet. And there are simple steps people can take to stay safe or their animals. So we'll kind of go through some of those. And so since we're really focusing on messages that the public can take to protect themselves from this, it's really important that we craft our message well. And so we want to make sure that our advice can lead to action. So it needs to be specific. What do we want people to do? It needs to be clear, right? So we can't use a ton of scientific jargon that non-scientists don't understand. That's not very clear to everybody. And it needs to be complete. We want people to know and feel empowered that they have all of the information that they need. And we at CDC do this in several different ways, one of which is on the CDC website, we'll put up um, something called an investigation notice. And this just kind of walks you through the outbreak, what's happening, who's affected. So it gives you the case count, the number of people and where they're from, we'll include advice to consumers and retailers. 
and we'll include any relevant links, so links to other educational materials or links to the FDA website if there's a pet food recall. We also use social media. So we have um, several CDC, Facebook, and Twitter channels. And this really gives us the opportunity to engage with the public in real time conversation. And so you kind of get immediate feedback on if your message is worth or not. Um, so for the hedgehog outbreak example, we did see a lot of people actually tagging their friends who own pet hedgehogs and saying, hey, you want to read this? Um, and then for one of our baby poultry outbreaks, it's not this. Um, example here exactly, but someone had tried to be creative with language. And I think it was something like, don't touch it, or after you touch a chick, wash your hands so you don't get sick, which is a really cute and catchy message. But it kind of took a little bit of a different twist there. Um, there were some folks referring, you know, to female humans as chicks. And so you can kind of see if your message worked and had the intended um, consequences or not right away. And we also use it to drive traffic to our outbreak page or even some of our educational materials. The news also helps to really amplify our message. So we wanted to include some of the um, type or uh, headlines that you can see here for our hedgehog outbreak. And then this next one, I wanted to include um, to show ways that people might not realize they could be putting themselves a little bit at risk if wanting to, you know, show love to your animals, which we all do. Uh, but so if you get that photo on the left there, there's some little ducks swimming in the kitchen sink. And so it may seem innocent and fun, but if they have salmonella germs on their bodies and their feather on their feet, it's now getting into that water and they're splashing around having fun. And now the water is all over your kitchen, but it might not just be water. There might also be salmonella in there. And now you've kind of contaminated your kitchen, but in a way that you might not think of. Then you have a little boy kissing a duck which is, you know, always super cute, but if there's salmonella on that duck, it could be on his mouth now, it could be on his hands and on his clothes. Um, the Barbies in the turtle tank, those little turtles might have salmonella, the water might have salmonella, and now salmonella is all over Barbie and all of her accessories. And you can see there's some water that's splashed out there. So, it, you know, it may not be the best idea. <laughs> and then my new favorite, um, the little hedgehog in the mug, Super cute photo, but if that little hedgehog has salmonella on his little feet or on his body and you don't wash your mug super well, you could very well be kind of drinking a cup of salmonella later. So next I wanted to go through some of the um, educational materials that we have up on the website and you guys can download these for free. You can print them, use them. This is one, um, half of one of our stay healthy around small pets, so those hedgehogs and rodents. And it kind of gives you some of our messages here. We try to break it up, put it in boxes, make it very clean and easy to understand. Here's the second half of that graphic. You can find them up on that website, and we've included it later as well. So we really focus on those messages about you know, not kissing or snuggling your animals close to your face and cleaning their um, habitats and toys, you know, outside when possible, but also not in the kitchen sink or even your bathroom sink because your toothbrush could be right there next to the sink. I also wanted to highlight some of our other materials. So the, the one on the left for the turtles is part of a much larger infographic. And we wanted to, I wanted to highlight this because we also try to make sure that our message also is helping pets. So sometimes people might get concerned when they realize these small, tiny turtles um, are actually illegal to sell in the US because of their risk for kids getting sick. But we don't want people to just toss their animal out. We want to make sure that they're, you know, talking about it, returning them to a pet store or um, a rescue group. And then for our um, live poultry outbreaks, that's another graphic about um, staying healthy with your backyard chickens. We also have um, a little graphic here, and it also is available as an animated GIF on our website. Um, this one was really because some of our partners wanted a 
small graphic that could be used as a sticker to go on some of those poultry boxes as they're being shipped. And then since you guys are interested in food safety and pet food safety, I thought I'd show part of our pet food safety infographic. I have a couple slides of it here. It does have information about the, the risks of raw pet food. And also some simple tips so that you can stay healthy while you're feeding your pet, like keeping the food um, away from human food if possible, and also always following those storage instructions. So if it says it needs to be refrigerated, making sure that you do that. So you can find out more about the different diseases that pets can carry on the Healthy Pets, Healthy People website. And then you can find the educational materials on that publications page. And we also decided to give you guys the link to all of the different outbreaks that have occurred over the years. Um, so you can see that as well. And with that, we wanted to say thank you guys so much for having us on today. And these are our pets, if you're curious. <laughs> <laughs> so the pets on the far right hand side, this is in our mind. That's Tango and Cha Cha the cats. <laughs> and then um, the dog is named Sheldon. And then my cat is named Oliver. So cute. Thank you, Megan and Lauren. Um, really appreciate that, and it was uh, incredibly informative. Um, just even that little note about uh, keeping in mind the toothbrush near your sink uh, made me uh, think about, you know, just how some everyday activities, you know, you have to remember um, those little things, the toothbrush. So now we're going to take some questions. There were a couple questions about the slides and the handout. Um, again, the slides. Uh, will be available after the webinar on fightback.org under the events tab. We'll also post all of the handouts there as well if you're having issues downloading from the um, sidebar. The, um, let's see here, and then let's take our first question. So this question um, goes, what was the issue with the guinea pigs? What was the source of the exposure to salmonella? Was it from food, feces, petting, or petting on their fur? This is Megan with CDC. I think that's a great question. So one of the things that we do when we have someone who gets sick with salmonella is they actually get a, a re full routine questionnaire first. And it asks about everything from the foods they ate to any water they swim to any restaurants or events they attended and it asks about animal contact. And with these nine people, once we saw that this group of ill people that had a very similar strain of salmonella all happened to own guinea pigs, we thought, hmm, there's something else there. So what we often do is follow up with an additional questionnaire that does ask specific questions about the contact that they had with guinea pigs. And as you can imagine, with many of these children, we're interviewing the parents as proxies. And so um, sometimes on the phone, we could hear the mom or the dad saying, hey, do you remember cleaning out your guinea pig's cage? Do you remember what happened? And I can say that in not only this outbreak, but others, some of the most common types of exposures are um, not having really rigorous or thorough hand washing by children after they're cleaning the guinea pig, cleaning up the guinea pig's poop, or cleaning its cage. Um, the second would be cuddling or kissing the guinea pig and just not being aware that the guinea pig could actually carry um, salmonella on its fur or on its feet. Um, guinea pigs don't necessarily wash their little paws after going to the bathroom and so we do know that that germ can be in their habitat and on their fur. Um, the other interesting thing I think when we talk about our multi-tiered approach is we did go back one level from the, the people who got sick to the pet stores. And what we found is that in some instances, some guinea pigs had been um, actually returned to the pet store either after the guinea pig was ill or after the child gets, got sick. And sometimes those guinea pigs were resold without having a um, test or actually a, a veterinarian really thoroughly look at them. So that means that if one person returns their guinea pig, which is a responsible thing to do if you're looking to rehome it, 
um, to the pet store, we, th we thought that that might be an opportunity for veterinarian or other animal health professional to take a look before it goes out the door to another family to make sure it doesn't have a germ that people can get. And then even up and beyond that, um, looking at the producers of guinea pigs, notice that there's a wide variety of different producers and ways that people produce guinea pigs in the United States. And some producers have really good practices where they're keeping the guinea pigs housed in areas that are clean, they're feeding them really good nutritious food, they're changing out their water. But in some instances, there are guinea pig producers that aren't necessarily adhering to some of those really good practices. So we talked a lot with the pet industry and a lot with producers about what could be done to raise the guinea pigs before they even end up in the stores in a way that actually helps to reduce the burden of salmonella. And that way, by the time they get to the store and then get into the, the household and are the pet of that child and have a name, um, by that time, they're less likely to be carrying salmonella. Although at the end, we still want to make sure everybody's washing their hands just in case. Yeah, it's hand washing is so important um, for, I think it's the number one most cited uh, uh, method of control for lots of um, illnesses out there. So um, hand washing always. Thank you, Megan. Um, just a reminder, if you have a question, you can use the uh, chat box on the uh, right side there in your panel. Um, there was a question about whether or not you can share this presentation with others. Yes, please do. Again, that it'll be available for you on the fightback.org events tab, and you can forward along to whoever you think uh, would be interested. So uh, thank you for that question. This next question, well, is submitted to us in the form of a statement, but I think I will follow up with a question um, to you, Megan and Lauren. Uh, so their statement goes, our office receives lots of questions from people inquiring about making pet food and or pet treats, usually in their home, for sale. And generally, these are sales from online websites and vendor stands at festivals slash craft shows, etc. Uh, they feel there is not much, if any, oversight for these types of people. Uh, is from the CDC's perspective, you know, what would you recommend to our health educators who are encountering this, um, encountering people who are homemaking their own pet food? That is an excellent observation. Um, I think Lauren and myself, whenever we go out around Atlanta, we often also notice that there's a lot of um, pet treat vendors or, or food vendors and um, we question often whether or not there is regulatory oversight. And so I think in, in exploring that a little bit ourselves, one of the things that we have learned is how important it is to actually approach this from a One Health perspective. So Lauren and I, we work more on the human public health side, but we know that our animal health colleagues, for example, at either the Georgia Department of Agriculture or the USDA or the FDA have experience in this area. So one of the things that we've done when we encounter this is actually we reach out to them and ask what type of state or local laws and regulations exist around the manufacturing and production of pet food for sale in your state. And one of the tough things can be, it, it differs a little bit from state to state, but I will say that most states actually do have um, officials and inspectors who have a specialty in animal food and animal food safety, who actually are in charge of making sure that when um, pet food is produced for sale to the public, and sometimes it's only in large quantities, but sometimes it's any sale, um, that it's done in a manner that is safe. And oftentimes those groups need to have something similar to what we would have with a, a restaurant or a food producer where they need to have their kitchen inspected and may even potentially need to have a license. Again, it differs according to different states, but I think that if you have those questions or you observe that happening in your state, it's a great idea to reach across to the animal health um, folks in your state and ask a little bit more about what laws, regulations, et cetera, exist. The other thing I like to um, ask about and, and be as an informed advocate on behalf of my cats. 
So if I am going to actually um, purchase any pet food, whether it's that that I get in the store or from a pet store, or I'm at the um, farmer's market and I see some treats being produced, I try to be an informed advocate on their behalf and actually ask vendors or read the labels and find out a little bit more about how the food is produced. So I am very, very cautious with respect to different ingredients, making sure everything is properly cooked. And a lot of times when I ask those questions, the vendors are very forthcoming and say, oh yes, we have a great relationship with our um, agriculture group or those that regulate this, we are inspected and here's the way we produce the food to ensure that its nutritional value is acceptable and it doesn't have the germs in it. But I think that's another important piece is not only looking at the regulatory component and being a good One Health partner, engaging with those groups that do regulate it, but also being an informed advocate. And then of course, Lauren and myself and those at FDA who regulate pet food are always keeping our eyes and ears open and out for any outbreaks of illness. And that provides us an opportunity to learn a little bit more about what's going on with pet food safety. And in the instance of FDA and pet food specifically, when there's a contaminated or concerning product that's on the market and that is documented, FDA can potentially take action to remove those things from the market along with state or local regulatory officials. Thank you, Megan. Uh, we have a couple, um, I think maybe a few more questions here, a couple themes I wanted to pull out real quickly. Someone asked about who will win, who won the uh, gift card, and we'll announce that <laughs> here in a few moments. So hang on, everybody. <laughs> um, but a couple themed questions here. Um, someone asked, uh, where do you recommend cleaning dog and cat dishes? Or I assume this could go to other um, pet um, uh, materials. Most people, they say most people probably wash them in the kitchen sink. Is this safe? Well, we recommend, we do agree that you should regularly wash your cats and dogs dishes just to make sure that there, there's a buildup of germs or of bacteria on those dishes. Um, one, things I, one thing I do in my house is I actually have a um, sink that's in one of my laundry room areas. I call it a mud sink and it's a place where I don't wash any dishes or anything that I use for human food. So it's a dedicated sink that I have in my house. Um, where I actually will take those bowls and wash them out. And I make sure that any implements I'm using to wash those are also not used for human food. The other thing I can do with some of my other animals' food dishes are actually take them outside and I get that side on the lawn with a hose, especially if it's warm out and a scrub brush, and I make sure I clean them out out there. And then I set them out in the sun to dry. And I feel like the combination of both the soap and water provides some sanitation, and then some natural UV light really helps to get rid of the germs. So that is the recommendation. Now, in the event that you actually don't have have those types of things at your, um, those types of sink or hose um, at your disposal, or the weather is just too cold to do it outside, then, you know, understand that people will be washing their, their pets' dishes in some of these places. But it's a good idea to keep in mind that you might need to clean or disinfect your sink or other area after you go ahead and wash your pets' dishes just to make sure that you're not doing any cross-contamination. And definitely don't use the same washcloths or scrub brushes or sponges to clean your pet's food as you do to, or your pet's bowls as you do to clean your human bowls. And I know it might seem really silly to say that, but it would, it would uh, surprise you how often those types of things are actually mentioned to us on questionnaires and even in some of our um, questions that we get from the public. Oh, great, thank you. And last question, so we, we've done a lot of questions slash statements about this, um, so you, maybe you've heard them before. Um, we've received a lot of questions about the fact that people just love to kiss their animals on the lips, um, dogs, cats, all of them. <laughs> um, and so what would you recommend um, to those who just can't resist the smooches? So this is Lauren and I like to tell people that there are other ways that we can show up to our pets so we can get them their favorite treats every now and again and get them a new toy or something new for their habitat. We can even you know, talk to them very sweetly, maybe even sing them a song if that's your jam. Um, but there are other ways to do it. 
So that's really what we try to encourage people to do and really start that with young kids at an early age so that it doesn't just become a habit. Absolutely. I agree with Lauren. And I think that um, especially for young children, it's a great way to teach them about how to be responsible and caring around animals and know that type of affection appropriately, especially because um, aside from some of our germs we see here with Salmonella E. coli, um, dog bites and other animal bites to children in the face are especially common. So teaching children about how to appropriately pet or approach animals is really, really important. Same thing for adults. And not only will that help you to avoid any um, disease or illness, but it can also um, help, you know, keep, keep your pets um, happy too. So we think that's really important. And I know Lauren and I today focused a little bit on um, most of the gut bugs, the enteric bugs, but our Healthy Pets Healthy People website has a lot of information about some other germs that are carried in dogs' mouths and cats' mouths that can potentially cause people to get sick, but don't cause dogs and cats to get sick. And those are also a concern if you're letting pets to lick your face or um, lick any wounds or open doors you might have. Oh boy, tough message on Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. I think that all we got tons and tons of questions, but just uh, to respectful of everybody's time, we'll have to move on. Um, but thank you, Megan and Lauren, so much. I'm, I'm assuming that it's okay that. Um, I think you mentioned uh, in your slides a place where people can go and ask um, some additional questions of you too. Is that right? Am I recalling correctly? Absolutely. I know there's um, definitely links and other places on the CDC website where you can put in some questions. Um, and we love to hear those and strongly encourage you to take this presentation and share it widely, share any new tips, facts with any friends or family, and definitely enjoy your pets. We really loved seeing those pictures of um, people with their pets today and really think overall having pets and enjoying them is a really great thing. We just want to make sure people and pets stay healthy. Wonderful. And so do we. Thank you, Megan and Lauren. Thank you so much. So we'll go to our next slide, Michelle. The winner of the pet submission um, photos will receive a $20 Amazon gift card. This was done through a random drawing. Um, hopefully they are still on this webinar. You must be on the webinar to attend. So drum roll, please. And the winner is Kristen Killoran with her rooster. Uh, Kristen, if you're still on, please type in the message box that you're here. And then Michelle, let me know <laughs> if you see that come through. Um, and then we will uh, contact you and figure out uh, how to get you that gift card. Michelle, any, any response? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, we'll do a, um, oh, I see a message now. Sorry about that delay. It looks like she is on. So Kristen, we will um, reach out to you. I think we have your contact information from your registration and we'll make sure you get you that gift card. And thank you so much for submitting your, your adorable picture there and joining us today. Next slide, please. Just a little reminder, we are hosting, the partnership is hosting a conference on March 6th through 8th in Orlando, Florida. Um, if you go to that URL link there, you can register to join us. We'll be talking about all types of um, things related to food safety education, um, effective strategies. We have Ellie Krieger joining as a keynote speaker and Chef Adam Glick from um, Bravo TV's Below Deck. So we have a, a great program and we hope you plan to join us. Next slide, please. And we want to thank um, the partnership's uh, partners for making this possible. Um, these folks uh, provide us with year-round support um, to make sure that we're supporting health and food safety educators. Next slide, please. Here's a full list of all of those um, that keep us afloat throughout the year and, and who we coordinate with to make sure we're getting the best message out there to reduce foodborne illness. Next slide, please. 
And again, you can get your CEU, um, CEU certificates um, on the handouts panel on the, the website at fightback.org under events. Um, and they'll also be included in the follow-up email that you should receive from us. Next slide, please. And we hope you remember to take the survey. Let us know how we're doing. Um, we really pay attention to those responses and um, make adjustments. So your, your feedback is really important to us. Next slide. And thank you again. Thank you, uh, Megan and Lauren, for joining us. And thank you to um, all of you that tuned in today on Valentine's Day and shared your pictures with us. Uh, we really appreciate you um, showing interest in this topic and we hope that you've taken away some key messages to to make sure that um, stay safe from illness and um, can continue to love on your little fur babies and scaly babies too so thank you all <laughs>